Okay, guys, uh, welcome everybody from around the world. I hope everyone is doing well, everybody's safe in these times of coronavirus. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here to talk a little bit about women's beach soccer. And in special, what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about the 2019 Aero Winners Cup, the Women's Aero Winners Cup that happened in Nazaré in Portugal. Uh, my name is Francis Farbro, and, my, and I am the head coach of the U.S. women's national team, okay? And today we have very special guests here with us today. We have Paula, Sa uh, Paula Sanz, who is the coach of Madrid, one of the teams that participated in this tournament that reached the final. We have Carol Gonzalez, which was the forward from Playa de San Javier, which was the team that won the tournament. She's also from the Spanish national team. He, she, they are the, she was the best player of the tournament and also she's the best player in the world, according to the last uh, tournament in Qatar, the Aero Women's, the tournament that happened in Qatar, the World Beach Games. Also, we have Katie James from the English national team. And also she's, she has a lot of experience. She's played in all four editions of the tournament. Uh, we have Barbara Colodeci from Brazil also Brazilian national team player, and she played with Lady Grembach in the last edition of the tournament. And we have from the Zvedda team and the Russian national team, very experienced goalkeeper, Anna, and also her coach, which is also from the Russian national team here with us. So I wanna welcome everybody. Thank you for participating and saying hi to everybody around the world. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to welcome uh, Paula. Hola, buenos días, Paula. Buenas tardes, ¿cómo estás? Gracias por participar. Eh, eh, te quería dar la bienvenida y ¿cómo estás hoy? Buenas Paula. tardes. Eh, lo primero, Francis, y muy bien. Encantada de estar aquí a pasar un rato agradable con, con vosotros y con la gente que nos esté viendo ahora mismo. Gracias. Uh, she says she's very happy to be part of this presentation and all the people that are watching. Uh, hola, Carol, ¿cómo estás? Bienvenida. Carol? Hello? Carol? Sí, dime. Bienvenida, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, se me paró esto y tuve que bajar al, al salón a que me funcionase. Okay, bienvenida, bienvenida. Okay, uh, Katie, how are you today? Welcome to the talk. To the talk. I am. Yeah, I'm doing good. How are you? Very good, very good. 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 And we have also Barbara. Barbara, bom dia, boa tarde, bem-vinda. Bom dia, bom dia, tudo bom? Prazer estar aqui também. Okay, obrigado. And lastly, we have Anna. How are you, Anna? You ready? I'm a goalkeeper. Especially, okay, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. You're gonna speak in English, correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Hi, coach. Welcome as well, Ivan. Coach Ivan. Hi to everyone. Okay, so here we go. We'll get started. Uh, Okay, the first thing we wanna talk a little bit about just overall, today the presentation is about the Aero Winners, the Aero Winners Women's in Nazaré in 2019. Uh, this tournament, we had a total of uh, uh, 20 teams that participated, okay? And we had a total of 468 goals in the tournament. There was a total of 68 matches and an average of 7.5 goals per match. What we did today uh, for this talk, we analyzed 80 of the goals from this tournament. The goals in the quarters, semis, finals, and consolation matches, okay? And that's how we came up with some of the statistics that we'll talk today in, um, in detail, okay? Uh, if, you, if you look at the, at the numbers, they're very interesting. 34, per, uh, 34 of the goals 
were from possession, meaning that the team had the ball and build the play. That means that that was 42.5% of the goals. So I want to start with uh, Paula. Quiero empezar contigo, Paula. Quería saber tu opinión. ¿Por qué crees, eh, Paula, why do you think that 42% of the goals were from building the play in possession? ¿Por qué crees que 42% de los goles fueron de posesión de la pelota en jugadas construidas? Eh, bueno, yo creo que, que en el fútbol femenino eh, se intenta elaborar mucho porque la mayoría de las jugadoras vienen de, de fútbol y entonces yo creo que buscan más una posesión que tal vez un juego demasiado directo y, y ahí lo vemos reflejado en este porcentaje, es casi la mitad de los goles. Okay. O sea, perdón, gracias. la mitad del de porcentaje. Muchas gracias. Eh, she thinks, she feels that the reason why 42% of the goals are from possession because a lot of the players come from an outdoor background in the women's game. So they are used to playing this type of game. So they're always going to try to build and play. Um, I want to ask your opinion, uh, Carol. I want to know why do you think that uh, 15% and, and, and what is the importance of the free kick? And why do you think that, fi that 15% of the goals were at a free kick? Carol, quería saber tu opinión, tú como jugadora. ¿Por qué crees que el 15% de los goles fueron eh, de tiro libre? Y también, ¿qué haces tú como jugadora para prepararte para un torneo y para eh, este, tirar muy bien los tiros libres? No se escucha. En mi caso, soy jugadora de, de fútbol 11 y compagino pues, fútbol 11 con, con fútbol playa. Y la verdad que yo creo que el, 12 por, o sea, que el porcentaje del que hablas tú es así porque la gente entrena individualmente todo el año estas cosas, porque no te juntas todo el año con, con tu equipo para poder entrenar eh, circunstancias del juego. Entonces, yo en mi caso, cuando tengo un ratito libre, pues me voy a la playa, cojo mi balón y entreno todas, todas mis virtudes. Okay, muchas gracias. Uh, she says that the re she also she comes from the outdoor game, so she plays professional outdoor and she plays uh, beach soccer. And she she the way she works on her free kicks is whenever she has free time and opportunity to train, she trains her individual skills, which are in the free kicks. So that's why she feels this these numbers. Uh, Katie, I want to have your opinion uh, regarding, as you can see that 23 of the goals, which is 34%, were all made out of one goal. So in your opinion, why do you think this happened? And, and you as a player, do you train this specifically? Or uh, please give me your thoughts on this. Um, I think I'm right in saying these goals were analyzed from the quarterfinals onwards. And I think at this stage of the competition, you're, you're six days, seven days in, and you're starting to fatigue. So I think a lot of the goals were were one pass goals because speed of play was quicker, um, fatigue, I think you try and play forward quicker. Um, and I also think the um, the level across the game is, is massively increased and and the game is becoming more of a tactical battle and there's less opportunities to kind of combine and stuff and the, the quickness of the play has definitely, definitely got faster. Um, so yeah, that's why I think the, the goals are coming from less passes. Okay. Thank you, Katie. And we'll get more into that, into all these numbers, but I just want to get uh, your initial perspective. Now, um, I have a question for Barbara. Uh, Barbara, uh, you played in all four editions of the tournament. And uh, tell me a little bit uh, about, about the average of the goals. What do you think? Seven, almost eight goals per game. Uh, what is your opinion about this? What do you think? Do you, do you feel that this is a high number, a low number? Você jogou nas quatro edições, Bárbara, do torneio. Eu queria que você falasse um pouquinho sobre o, a, a porcentagem de 7,5 gols por partida. Na tua opinião, você acha que é um número alto ou baixo em 2019? Bárbara, não te escuto. Tudo bom? Então, eu acho o número alto, mas também acho que o beat soccer é muito aberto, né? Eu acho que se for comparar 
os jogos de soccer são muito abertos, então eu acho que sempre há possibilidade de muitos gols, eu acho um bom número, uh, eu acho que está relativamente dentro da média dos jogos, se for analisar campeonatos e tudo mais. Ok, obrigado. muito obrigado. She feels it is a good number, she feels that beat soccer is a game that's very open and people can score at any point. Ok? Thank you, Barbara. And now to, I want to introduce our goalkeeper, Ana. And I want to ask her, Ana, uh, do you think, why do you think the large amount of goals in throw-ins, which is uh, 12% of the goals were in throw-ins? Why do you think this, this happened, in your opinion? from playing all these years and all your experience? Um, I think uh, that uh, uh, the problem uh, is the quality of passes in uh, women's beach soccer. So, uh, uh, for example, on the corner, you can only pass uh, with your feet and uh, this is problem uh, for many players. Uh, you have have more options on uh, throw in hands and uh, feet. Maybe one has a different opinion. Opinion. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with them. Uh, I think that uh, when we see the throw wins, uh, we have more uh, good situation. So maybe uh, Katie, uh, Katie said about uh, that it's uh, was analyzing of uh, quarterfinals, semifinals, and uh, uh, final games, and it was a uh, fifth, six, and seven days. So maybe the people think about uh, easy uh, decision, simple decisions. So maybe we see uh, the throw-ins goals in that uh, number. Thank you very much, Ivan. And I have a question for you guys. You as a you guys train and prepare really well in Russia in Zvezda. Do you? How much percentage do you put into throwing plays as a, as a team? I think uh, it's not our uh, strong feature. I think that in the future we may train this a lot of, but uh, now I think that our goals, it's possession goals and goals with goalkeepers, but not throw wins, not corner kicks. And I and Delia are thinking about this because the men's uh, beach soccer team, Russia, you know, have a very good percent of goals by the set pieces, throw-ins, corner kicks, but not a woman. So I think in the future we may train this uh, component of our game. Okay, thank you very much. And also another fact that's interesting that we'll talk about is that 58% of the games in the quarters and on were divided, decided by only one goal. Okay, so it, it was a very, very tight race. Okay. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Paula, uh, why do you think the goals were only decided one, by one goal? In your opinion, you as a coach, ¿por qué crees que tú como entrenadora hubo un margen tan chiquito de, de, de goles en los partidos? Solamente un gol. De diferencia en el 58%. Eh, yo creo que, que eso significa que al final la, la competición está siendo cada año más igualada. Las jugadoras tienen más nivel, los equipos se intentan preparar mejor y al final cada partido es, es mucho más complicado de, de ganar eh, y sobre todo de, de ganar por una diferencia de, de goles eh, clara. Gracias. She feels that the team, the level is, is getting higher, the teams are well, are well prepared and that's the reason why the, the, the games are very close. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit, you know, I think I, uh, we're very blessed here to have you guys that have a lot of experience in this competition. I know Zvezda has been in all four competitions. Anna and Ivana have been there. Katie also have been in all four competitions. Also, um, you know, Barbara, Carol, and uh, Paula also, she participated for the first time last year. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the event. Uh, the first edition was in Catania, okay? Uh, we had 12 teams in 2016. Second edition was in Nazareth. We had 16 teams, okay? So we see a growth. And then 2018, also Nazareth, 20 teams. And 2020, I'm sorry, 2019, we also had 20 teams. So you can see the growth of the tournament and it, the continuing balance. So I want to get... Uh, 
the opinion of, of Carol, since you participated in, in all four events, uh, what, how do you see the evolution and the difference from the first one to the last one? Carol, tú que participaste en los cuatro eventos, eh, quería un poquito tu opinión sobre la diferencia entre del primero al, al, al último evento. ¿Qué ves tú de diferencia? Gracias. A ver, yo en mi caso eh, solo fui a los tres eventos de Nazaret. En Catania, pues, ah, okay. no, conocía, no conocía esta modalidad. Pero se ve una clara evolución del fútbol playa porque cada vez hay más equipos que, que se apuntan a esta competición y, y que realmente apuestan por ello. Y eso, pues, la verdad que es bueno tanto para el fútbol playa en general como para nosotras. Cuanto a más competición y más competencia haya, mejor. Gracias. She says that she participated only in the three editions of Nazaret, and she feels that every year she sees that teams are taking it more serious, preparing, preparing better, investing more in the competition, so she sees a bright future. Now I want to get your perspective. Katie, I know you did play in all four, correct? You played with Portsmouth the first three, and yeah. then you played with the Spanish team last year. So I want to get your perspective uh, from the first one in Catania to the last one. How do you see the evolution of the tournament? Um, I think it's just a completely different game now. Back in 2016, it was it was kind of the, the fundamentals of beat shocker. Um, play short, play it back to your goalkeeper, throw long, and, and that was kind of it. And goals were scrappy. There was a lot of floor play. Um, but now, we've as we've progressed, you see more and more of, of the men's side of the game coming into the women's game. And I think that shows by the amount of teams that are now participating that it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And hopefully... The next, the next Euro winners will have even more teams in 20. Thank you. Sorry. So now, uh, still talking about the history, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the go average. As you can see in Catania, and that's why I asked you that, Katie, there was a 9.38 average per game. Then it went a little bit down the next year in 2017. It went down more in 2018. And then it went back up this last year. Uh, I want to ask Anna, since you participated in all four editions, why do you think there was such a big drop from, you know, the first year to the third, and then it went back up? What is your opinion? Tell me a little bit. Uh, I think uh, in uh, 2018, uh, they were very difficult with the conditions in Nazareth. Uh, it was very windy, so the number of goals uh, scored decreased. And um, in uh, 2019, the unpredictable ball, oh my God, <laughs> has become a big problem for goalkeepers. And uh, the number of illogical goals scored uh, has increased. It's my opinion. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And what, uh, 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 Barbara? Uh, what do you what do you think was the the reason for this decrease in your opinion? Why the first year 9.38, then seven, six, then seven again? Barbara, porque você acha que teve essa queda na na média de gols? Primeiro foi muito alto, depois baixou. Você que participou das quatro edições. Então, eu acredito que na primeira edição era 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 muito tudo muito novo, né? As equipes não se conheciam. Então, existia, acho que, uma, uma discrepância, uma diferença das equipes um pouco maior. Para o segundo ano, eu, eu percebi uma evolução das equipes e das jogadoras, e cada vez mais. Talvez aí essa volta né, aumentou um pouquinho aí do 2018 para 2019, pela preparação, por já, eu não vi tanta diferença entre, de nível entre 2018 e 2019, eu achei mais igual. Só que do primeiro ano teve uma evolução muito maior de preparação das equipes e das atletas. Obrigado. So she feels that the first year there, there, there was a lot of goals because the teams didn't know each other and there was a lot of surprises. They didn't really know each other. Then teams started to prepare more and they knew what to expect, what not to expect. And that's why she feels that the numbers, the average of goals went down and then went back up because they, there were more, more preparation with that. Okay. Now we're going to talk, also talking about the history and something that's interesting because uh, I know Ivan was here last week with Coach Perry. They were talking about the national teams. And 
you know, uh, Switzerland was dominating at the national team level. And also, as you can see, they were dominating at the club level. So the first two editions were won by Swiss, Swiss teams. We had the Grasshoppers in 2016. We had Havana Shots in 2017, 2018. We had Esvesda in 2019. We had the Spanish team, IAS. So uh, I have a question for you, uh, Anna. Again, since you got Anna and Ivan, you guys won the tournament in 2018, correct? Uh, so since you mentioned the, situ the, the weather, you know, there, there was a, and then maybe that's what the average went down. So tell us a little bit, did that help you guys? Did the weather help you win that tournament? And also, uh, what did you do differently the next year? Because the next year in 2019, you guys were knocked, knocked out in the, before the quarters. So tell me a little bit between those two tournaments and your experience. Uh, yes, uh, the weather in Nazare in uh, 2018, such as St. Petersburg, such as in Russia, so we can play as a home so maybe maybe it's one of the factor for of our victory but i think that uh, it's um, very interesting to listen anna of our way to victory because we play three tournaments and try to to win try to win and anna says something about this yes uh, our way start in uh, 2060 uh, it was the first uh, international tournament uh, for my team and uh, we took third place. Uh, there were a lot of emotions, but uh, we knew we could have done more. We lost in the semifinals uh, with a score of 3-4. Uh, in uh, 2017, the tournament uh, started very well for us and uh, we lost again in the semifinals uh, with a score of 3-4 and uh, then lost in the match for third place and with the same score of 3-4. I think uh, this was a fatal score for my team, 3-4. So we were very angry with ourselves and uh, prepared for the third attempt uh, for a long time. Uh, that anger, that experience, uh, the maximum concentration in every match and uh, result, uh, we were champions. So, okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, now I have a question for Paula. Paula, uh, why do you, you know, as we can see, 2019 was a very dominant year for the Spanish teams and, and national team. In this edition of 2019, we had six Spanish teams, two teams in the final, Madrid and Playa San Javier. Uh, why do you think this this happens? Is it because of the league? Is it why do you think that Spain is, is and also Spain won in Qatar? Why do you think this happens? Por qué crees, Paula, que el año 2019 pasó es de, de este dominio que había de Suiza, de Rusia, ahora pasó a España con seis equipos en el torneo y dos en la final? Bueno, yo creo que se debe a que muchas jugadoras que tenemos la suerte de tener en fútbol playa, tanto en la selección como en muchos equipos, eh, se pueden dedicar profesionalmente al fútbol y yo creo que eso se nota y hasta que se desarrolle más el deporte, el fútbol playa en las chicas, eh, va a ser así. Y luego también, evidentemente, los, los títulos, tanto en este caso como San Javier o, o nosotras con el Madrid, que llegamos a la final y España, que consiguió el oro en, el, eh, en Qatar, pues eso al final eh, se ve reflejado en el país, ¿no? Que tenemos la suerte de, de tener una liga nacional, una copa, una supercopa, y, y eso al final cuenta y suma. Claro, ok. Eh, she says that she feels, eh, because the, a lot of the Spanish players play professional soccer as well, so that helps. They have a strong national team and, and there's a high motivation to play and it's a very competitive environment for the women in, in Spain and not only in soccer, but in beach soccer. Gracias. Now uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the present, the present of the sport. Now we know the history, now let's talk a little bit about the present and this, the competition that happened, the one that we're talking a little bit about. So some interesting numbers, like we said, uh, statistics, 58% of the games were decided by only one goal, which is very, very close. Also, something very interesting was an 80, 81, uh, 
So I'm sorry about this. I want to know your opinion, Katie. Why do you feel, you know, that the games were only 58% of the goals, which is uh, uh, more than half, were decided by only one goal, in your opinion, being such an experienced beach soccer player? <laughs> Um, I think obviously over the years the the standard has increased. Um, I think goalkeepers every year have improved. Uh, I've seen some of the best shot stopping um, this year than what I have in any other year. Um, and I think the tactical side of the game's developed. Um, a lot of teams are now setting up um, to face their opponents, and they're changing their their structure and their defensive their defensive shape to defend the opposition. So I think it's becoming more and more difficult to score against teams and break them down. And I think that just shows in how close the games have been. And I know, uh, speaking from experience, we've played a couple of times against Sredstar and it's always been a, a close game because it becomes a tactical battle of trying to break each other down. And it's always exciting to watch because you're on the edge of your seat the whole time. So the closer the, the games are, I think the more exciting they are to watch. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, now, also another inter interesting statistic is that 81% of the teams that score, the, that score first won the game in the quarters and on. So, you know, is that, so basically in, in this tournament, the, the team that scores first, almost the majority of the time, a very big majority won the game. Uh, I want to ask Barbara, experienced national team player from Brazil, also played it, in Italian teams, played in Polish teams. Uh, why do you think this, this happens? Por que você acha que no, nesse torneio o time que fez, fazia o gol primeiro, 81% das vezes ganhava o jogo? Então, eu acho, o número, eu acho aí um número muito alto, né? Até porque o beat soccer, como eu tinha falado antes, é um jogo muito aberto, incerto, até o último segundo, tudo pode mudar. Mas levando em conta que foi analisado né, a fase final, quartas, semis e finais, eu posso dizer talvez pela... Lógico, né, quem sai ganhando tem uma vantagem, mas talvez pelo psicológico de correr atrás de, do placar diverso. Ok. She feels that this number is, is very large, uh, 81%, because beat soccer is a game that goals can happen many ways, but she thinks maybe it's a psychological aspect. So the team that started winning, it was hard psychologically to, 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 you know, to find a way to come back. And then if you look at the next stat, 72% uh, of, the, of the teams, they were winning by the end of the second period, also won the game. So it, it kind of correlates to that. Um, so I asked the same question to you, Anna. Why do you think, uh, do you also agree with Barbara as a psychological thing? Why do you think this happens? Uh, uh, yes, I agree with Barbara. This is only psychology. Uh, the team before the third period understands uh, that uh, in 12 minutes the match will be over and uh, the victory will be in the pocket. Players uh, are more calm and, and uh, focused. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, the opponent uh, understands uh, that uh, they have only 12 minutes to change the situation. Uh, time flies very fast. Uh, players start uh, to get nervous. Uh, the hurts turn off, uh, tactics are forgotten, and uh, the team game is uh, lost. So this is psychology. Thank you, Anna. Now, I have a, I want to ask Carol, because you guys, Playa San Javier, in the semifinal, you started losing, if I'm not mistaken, against uh, the French team and you guys came back and won the game. So tell me, what does it take? You were one of the few teams that were losing and won the game. What does it take to be able to turn the game around? Eh, te hago la pregunta a ti, Carol. Eh, ustedes fueron uno de los pocos equipos que iba perdiendo, empezó perdiendo el partido y remontó el resultado. ¿Cómo lo hicieron? Cuéntame. ¿Cuál es el secreto? A ver, nosotros no tenemos secreto ninguno, ni tenemos pócima. Lo que pasa es que psicológicamente somos muy fuertes y no todo es como empieza, sino que pensamos que hasta el último segundo siempre, siempre tenemos opciones, vayamos ganando, vayamos perdiendo o, o lo que sea. Entonces, trabajamos para ello, porque si en el primer tiempo vas perdiendo de cuatro, luego en el segundo, en dos minutos, puede cambiar todo. Nos pasó con, con Brasil, también en Qatar, que íbamos perdiendo 
de, de tres o de dos y al final pues remontamos bastante y con el Playa San Javier muchas veces pues, pues también nos pasa y tenemos esa virtud que, que sabemos leer muy bien y, y no nos venimos abajo nunca, pase lo que pase. Gracias. I asked her what's the secret because they were one of the few teams to, to come back from behind and win a game. She said that there's no secret, it's just they're mentally tough that they are used to being in that situation and they always fight. No matter what the score is, they stay focused and try to read the game. Okay, now I want to ask uh, Paula, how do you train to be able to, to improve this number? For the next competition, how do you as a coach train so you can, you know, because there is a, this game is a game of momentum and always a team will have a momentum. So how do you prepare and train to be able to to improve that, because I think this is the key in this competition. Paula, tú como entrenadora, ¿cómo eh, entrenarías a tu equipo y lo prepararías mejor para poder a, a, eh, remontar resultados? Que creo que es algo que se puede mejorar en esta competición. Eh, yo creo que es un factor totalmente psicológico y al final son las jugadoras ellas mismas las que con eh, confianza y compitiendo, ganando mucha experiencia, eh, van a saber llevar estas situaciones y, y en el caso de que les toque remontar, eh, no venís abajo, sino eh, saber motivarse, motivar al grupo, al equipo y, y ir a por el partido y como ha dicho Carol, eh, a lo mejor puedes ir perdiendo 4-0, 3-0, pero esto es lo bueno que tiene el fútbol playa, que en dos minutos no puedes dar la resultado. Okay, uh, gracias. So she feels that it's up to the players. They need to be mentally strong and it comes with experience. So the more you play, the more you have situations like this, you will learn. Uh, and I, I want to, before we go to the next, I want to ask Katie, because I know you guys went since uh, they were talking about the Qatar games. I know you guys had a very adverse situation. You guys had red carded players. I believe it was the semis or the finals, right? and you guys play with players down and you were very close to winning the game. Tell me how as a team, what do you, what do you think you know, can, can improve and it can be done situation like this? Um, I think as a, as a nation, we prepared for that before the tournament. Um, we put ourselves in situations in training frequently where we were a player down um, or playing against a team of five and then we had four. So we put ourselves in that situation a lot of times in, in training leading up to it. Um, we were obviously hoping we weren't going to be in that situation, but um, even in the semi-finals, um, we had two players down and we managed to, to win that game. But unfortunately, in the final, with one player down, we couldn't do it again. But yeah, it's definitely something that Perry likes to incorporate into our sessions and prepare us for in case it happens in tournaments. Perfect. Thank you, Katie. So now... We're going to the next. Okay, perfect. Sorry, a little bit technical difficulties. So here we go. Now we're gonna go into more in-depth analysis and we're gonna talk a little bit about a broke staying consistent with what my peers have done in the last talks. We're going to break down the fields into zones. Okay. So as you can see, we have the zone one, which is the defensive zone is the box of the, the team that is attacking. Zone two is the defensive zone of the team that's attacking. Zone three is, is the attacking zone for the, for the team and zone four. So as you can see there, it would be the box of the opposite team. 91% of the goals were scored in zone uh, three and four in this tournament in the quarters and up, okay? Um, so I want to ask uh, Paula, why do you think this is? Why do you think most of the goals were scored in, were scored in zones three and four? Paula, quería saber por qué tú crees que 91% de los goles fueron hechos en la zona tres y cuatro en este torneo. Eh, bueno, yo creo que, que al final es lo normal, ¿no? La zona 4 es la, la más cercana a portería, por lo cual eh, un golpe, una finalización, eh, tiene mucha
muchas opciones de, de acabar siendo gol, pero lo que me llama la atención es sin duda la zona 1. Creo que al final en la zona donde va a estar siempre la, la portera, eh, por lo menos la, la mayor parte de, del tiempo, y en femenina hay que darle mucha más importancia, porque al final me parece una posición fundamental. Eh, la portera tiene que tener la misma habilidad que cualquier jugadora de campo, y igual que es decisiva para parar y evitar los goles, o sea, para, para finalizar o participar más en el juego. Muchas gracias. Uh, she feels that, that most of the goals were scored in zone three and four because it's closer to the goal, but she thinks that we have to give as coaches, as teams, more important to zone one, that not enough attention is paid to zone one, that we need to work more on that zone, and why not try to score from there, because the goal is a very important uh, part of the game. Okay, so here we're gonna have, we have some examples of, a, of goals in the zones. As you can see here, uh, this is a goal by, that was scored in zone three. I'm sorry, this is zone zone two. This is a goal. I'm sorry, a goal. This is a goal in zone three. This goal is in zone three, as you can see. It's a goal by Plaza San Javier in zone three. It's a it's one pass, it's a turnover. And it's one pass, and, and it's a goal by the Spanish player, Sara. There you go. Here we have a, a goal by San Remis. A goal with five passes, the keeper makes the save. She finds the wall pass, she finds the defender, a wall pass, another pass. And here we have a goal in zone four, which is where the most of the majority of the goals were scored. Very nice play, very nice combination. And We have a goal in zone three that we're missing, just to show everybody where zone three would be. Here's zone three. A goal by Carol, which is here with us. I'm sorry, zone two. Apologize, zone two. So I want to get the perspective of some of the players. Uh, Carol, Carol uh, I wanted to know, do you practice uh, scoring from a specific zone? Do you put more time into practicing shooting from zone three, zone two, zone four? ¿Tú le pones algún trabajo específico en los entrenamientos a patear de una zona más que de otra? A ver, yo como te dije antes, pues eh, soy afortunada de que los días que tengo libres pues voy a entrenar a la playa. Por desgracia, pues voy sola y la verdad que no puedo entrenar otras cosas que, que no sean golpeos y, y técnica individual. Y la verdad que sé que es una de mis virtudes eh, entrenar los golpeos desde zona 2, zona, zona 3 en este caso y, y, siempre, y siempre los entreno a tope porque es lo que me hace ser mejor deportista en este ámbito, entonces tonta sería si, si no lo hiciese, pero, pero bueno, yo intento entrenar todo lo que puedo y también, también mejorar las cosas que, que no hago bien, aunque es difícil cuando uno va a entrenar solo, pero, pero hay que intentarlo. Gracias. She says that since she, you know, she's a professional older player, but when she has free time, she goes to the beach and she trains by herself. 
And that's what she trains a lot. She trains a lot strikes from the different zones, being zone two, zone three, zone four, but she trains a lot on those, those striking. So that's what makes her a, a better player. Okay, now I wanna get your opinion, Katie. Uh, since what, what, can, what do you think teams can do to improve scoring more goals from, from zone two? Um, I don't think it's necessarily a case of what teams can do to improve. I think back players potentially need to create more space for themselves. But I think as the women game, women's games progressed, a lot of teams are now starting to press a lot higher, which isn't giving the back players an opportunity to flick it up or touch and shoot. So I think it's a bit of both. I think it's, it's the opposition you're against and how high they're pressing and also the back players um, moving to create space to, to create those shooting opportunities. So you feel that, that not a lot of goals happen in zone one and two because yeah. teams were high pressing and then creating space. So that's why most of the goals came in three and four. Yeah. And I think I think this is something that the, the Spanish are very good at is is looking to play off their pivot or their their forward. They like to play forward and set back into zone three or zone four and, and they get a lot of success from that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, do you... Uh, Anna and, and Coach Ivan, do you agree with this? That maybe a lot of the goals were in three and four because teams were pressing high and you had to play the ball in the space? Or what, what is your opinion about this comment from Katie? Yes, uh, we agree with Katie. And uh, Katie is a very good example of a player who scored from the zone two. It's a very good skill for uh, of Katie. So I think that uh, if you want to increase the goals from zone two uh, it's a training moment uh, but in another case case you can have the players who have a good shoot and uh, i think trainings and a good shoot of defenders and you have more and more goals from zone two but uh, for our teams i think that uh, goals from zone three and zone four is uh, <clears throat> is more high than in other zones and why maybe they are the same. Yeah. Um, I will answer this question as a goalkeeper. Uh, every year there are more and more strong goalkeepers. Uh, the skill level is growing and uh, it's not so easy to score such a goal from a long distance. Uh, the power of shots uh, in women is very different uh, from men. Uh, the ball flies for a long time and the uh, goalkeeper manages uh, to get uh, into the right position. Of course, uh, sometimes women score beautiful goals uh, from a long distance, but uh, today this is uh, still rare. And I can add uh, the other words. Uh, our goalkeeper, Sun and Victoria, will try to do their best to in increase the goals from zone two, because zone two it's a zone where a goalkeeper shoot to the goal. Thank you. So, okay, so now I want to get Barbara's perspective. It's very, it's very interesting because we have Katie that feels that most of the goals came from three and four because of the high press that is starting to become a trend in the game. Uh, Anna believes that is the quality of the goalkeepers, so that's why they, they go, they're not scoring from far. I want to get the perspective from uh, Barbara. Barbara, o que você acha? A Katie falou que ela acha que muitos dos gols saíram na zona 3 e 4 porque muitos times estão começando a, a marcar mais em cima, então obriga você a jogar a bola no espaço e por isso que os gols sa, sa, tem mais espaço na zona 3 e 4. E a Ana acha que é pela qualidade dos goleiros. O que você acha? Eu concordo um pouco com as duas. Eu acho que os times têm identificado também, às vezes nem só a marcação tão alta, mas têm identificado as boas chutadoras da equipe adversária. É, a Kate é uma excelente chutadora, então a gente jogando contra, a gente já fica atento para não deixar tanto espaço, assim como a Andrea Miranda, espanhola e outras tantas jogadoras que chutam tanto. Então, os times têm ficado mais atento em subir a marcação, sim. E eu concordo com a Ana, o nível das goleiras tem aumentado e não é tão fácil fazer gol nessas excelentes goleiras, assim como a Ana, tão de longe, né? Obrigado. So I, um, she, Barbara feels that is a combination of both. That is a combination of she, the, the pressure, 
But not only that, she feels the quality of the goalkeepers, but she also feels that as the game has grown, they, they identified who are the players that can shoot well from far. Like an example, Katie. So if she was playing against Katie, she knows Katie can shoot, so we have to not allow her to shoot from outside, so we're going to press her. So it's more of that, is the analysis of the game, getting to know each other. Thank you, Barbara. Now uh, we're going to break down a little bit, specifically from the teams that went to the quarters. Where do, uh, where do they score most of the goals? Okay, so uh, as you can see, Playa San Javier is score uh, most of the goals, which was the winning team. Eight of their goals came in the zone four, okay? Uh, and Madrid had six of the goals in zone four. So I want to ask uh, Paula, which was the coach of Madrid, uh, do you think, Paula, that we have to focus then on zone four based on this graphic? In the teams that were most successful, should we focus on, on training, on finishing on zone four? ¿Tú crees que basado en la, en la estadística y el gráfico que vemos, debemos enfocarnos en entrenar finalización en la zona 4? Hombre, yo creo que ahora mismo el tiempo que tenemos los equipos femeninos para preparar cualquier eh, torneo de fútbol playa es, es muy poco. Entonces, las tareas las enfocas a, a lo más eficaz. Yo creo que es raro ver que un equipo plantee una tarea en un entrenamiento en el que la, en el que la finalización se dé desde la zona 1 o la zona 2, ¿no? Tal vez eh, ahí es lo que te decía de que falta el trabajo con, con las porteras, que son las que tal vez lo vayan a efectuar más. Pero sí, evidentemente, o incluso las jugadoras cuando entrenan individualmente durante el año, seguramente donde más entren en la finalización los golpeos sean en, en estas zonas. Gracias. Uh, she feels that, that when you have time to prepare for a tournament is not a lot of time. So she can really focus on only finishing from one zone. She feels that the players have to work individually in working on the zones that they need to finish. And also that's why she thinks it's important to for the goalkeepers to get more involved and playing with the feet and, and shooting. This will help the game and, and make it more balanced. This is her opinion, okay? Uh, I want to get, Carol, ¿qué opinas tú sobre esta, esta, estos, este gráfico que, y la cantidad de los goles que son en cada zona? Específico a tu equipo, por ejemplo. Playa San Javier, ¿ustedes entrenaron más finalizar en la zona 4? No, a ver, nosotras... Eh, disculpa, disculpa. Do, perdón. Do you feel that uh, you as a team with these numbers, do you guys work more on finishing uh, in Playa San Javier on the zone, on, on the zone 4? Because you score more goals there? A ver, yo como dijo, como dijo Paula, tenemos muy poco tiempo cuando se acercan las competiciones para entrenar porque no nos dedicamos a esto todo el año. Entonces, es más fácil marcar un gol desde la zona 4 que desde la zona 1 o zona 0 en este caso. Entonces, yo creo que si tuviésemos mucho más tiempo para, para poder dedicarle a ello, a ver, somos muy afortunadas porque tenemos muchas competiciones españolas que, que nos hacen llegar a los torneos mucho mejor. Pues la Copa, la Liga, la Supercopa, campeonatos autonómicos y demás. Pero la verdad que, que no nos podemos dedicar a ello 365 días del año y que eso a la hora de sacar gráficos, pues, pues se nota. Claro, gracias. Yeah, she feels this similar to Paula, that there's, when they train as a team, they don't have a lot of time to train together, so it's hard to uh, specifically work on finishing on one zone, okay? So I want to ask uh, your opinion, Anna, on this, and also Ivan, your perspective on these numbers and how can we make it more balanced and maybe how would that help you tactically if you balance more goals from other zones? Like you said, the goalkeeper scoring or shooting more, how can we make this more balanced and how that would benefit teams? Yeah, I think that uh, the balance of the goal, of the number of the goals from uh, different zones, it's a training moment. Uh, you can uh, you can include uh, some uh, exercise for, to your trainings from the zone two. It's uh, maybe 
uh, actions uh, as a Katie, as a Barbara, want to to shoot from the long distance to uh, ball up and after the, the shooting, it's a maybe specific exercise. From the zone three, it's our strategy, it's our philosophy in Russia national team and in Zvezda. It's uh, goals after the combination with the goalkeeper. Uh, zone four, it's uh, finishing, it's uh, maybe finishing in the exercises, uh, finishing component uh, for forwards and for players who need the opponent's goal. And I think only the zone one, it may be not uh, a balance because. Uh, if you have players who have a very good shoot, the zone one is uh, your zone. But uh, in uh, women beach soccer, I think uh, we have only um, only few players uh, who who shoot very well from zone one. So for for the balance, you can mix uh, the exercises uh, on your trainings. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I believe it's very difficult to score in zone one. I believe. Maybe I remember in Paraguay in the World Cup, one goal, Ozu, for Japan, he scored from zone one. I remember this goal, but it's very difficult. It's very far. I agree. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the different types of goals. You know, you have the open play goals and the set pieces goals. Okay, and if you look at this graphic, you know, the open play goals are the plays that you the teams are building out of the back. They steal the ball as a counterattack, is a turnover. Uh, so this was the majority of the goals. It was 62%. And set pieces, which are throw-ins, corner kicks, free kicks, penalties. We had uh, kickoffs. We had 37% of the goals. Hey, I want to ask you, Barbara, why do you think is a higher percentage of the goals from open play? Why do you think, Barbara, that the majority of the goals are played as played? Primeiro, eu acho a probabilidade, né? O jogo tem muito mais chances criadas a partir da, do jogo aberto, né? E outra coisa é o que a Carol falou, né? As jogadoras treinam muito individualmente e principalmente, como o Paula também falou, as finalizações. E eu acho também a consciência da valorização da bola e pela possibilidade mesmo. Acaba que a gente chuta muito mais com o jogo, com a bola rolando, do que, do que em bola parada, em jogadas que é, o time também, o adversário está preparado para ser atacado, né? Então, eu acho que é a combinação dessas coisas. Obrigado. So she feels that it has to do a lot with the evolution of the game and like uh, the span, uh, like Carol was saying, that, you know, a lot of the players train a lot their individual skills, like shooting, with the ball rolling. So th that that's, she feels like some of the reasons that we have 62% of the goals from open play. Um, now let's go to the next slide. Uh, here you can see a little bit of a breakdown per team. Okay. You see that, uh, you know, the majority, like for example, Plaza San Javier, 76% of the goals were, were scored from open play and 24% from set plays. I want to ask you, uh, Carol, why do you feel you guys have a, such a high number of goals from open play? Uh, could it be because you guys are always trying to play possession game? ¿Por qué crees tú, Carol, que el equipo de ustedes tuvieron un mayor porcentaje de goles eh, jugadas abiertas, o sea, en, en, en situaciones de juego? ¿Crees que es porque siempre intentan tener posesión de la pelota, pasar la pelota, armar el juego? ¿Por qué crees tú que es esto? Yo creo que, que somos un equipo que, que nos gusta tener el balón y, y llevar la iniciativa del, del partido y eso hace que lleguemos más a finalizar. A veces se nos da mejor construir, otras veces pues no construimos tanto. Eso va dependiendo de, del partido y de, lo que, y de lo que necesitemos en cada momento. A ver si tú vas ganando de dos, igual no necesitas ser tan efectivo, entonces okay Muchas gracias. Uh, so she feels that there's a lot to do because they they're a team that always tries to possess the ball and that that I, is, she feels that is one of the reasons and they try to build and possess uh, te pregunto a ti, Paula I want to ask you Paula you guys are more of a balance attack 50 50 uh, why do you think por qué crees que el equipo de ustedes el Madrid 
en este torneo tuvo un ataque más, más equilibrado, 50% de goles de jugadas abiertas, 50 de jugadas paradas. Porque nos hacían muchas faltas. No, no. Eh, yo creo que al final éramos eh, un equipo mucho más vertical, es decir, nos gustaba tener el balón eh, alejado y, y estar con él cerca de la portería rival. Entonces obligas a que el rival te tenga que, que defender y porque al final cualquier eh, movimiento puede ser opción de, de golpeo y de finalizar en una zona 3 o 4, que es donde hemos visto que más goles se meten. Y yo creo que al final por eso. Ok, thank you. She feels, she said that because they, they hit their players a lot. It was a joke. <laughs> But what she said it was that she feels that their team is very vertical and they're always trying to look for the goal and aggressive. So maybe that, that's why she feels they would get fouled and, and that's why she had a balanced attack. I want to ask Barbara, you play for Lady, Lady Grimba, uh, correct? Lady Grimba. Uh, Barbara, why do you feel Your team had 100% of the goals from open play. Eh, Bárbara, por que você acha que o time que você representou, o Lady Granbach, 100% dos gols foram de jogada, jogadas abertas, construídas? Eu acho que tem relação né, a posse de bola, de construir uma jogada até achar uma melhor finalização. Temos meninas com talento para isso, né? E tínhamos umas duas atacantes que são fortíssimas, né? Adriele e Saque do Japão. Então, acho que um dos motivos é esse. E também a gente acabou saindo fora nas quartas de final, né? E aí eu não sei se a, como está a análise. Mas eu acredito nisso, na posse de bola e na, no, no talento individual das atletas. Obrigado. She feels that the reason they score most of the goals are from open plays because they always try to possess the ball and they had very talented players, talented forwards. So they're always trying to look for them and to combine. Thank you. Obrigado. Uh, now, if you look at the breakdown of the open play goals, we have a graph. Most of the 68% of the goals was building from the back. 20% was of turnovers and 12% was of, um, of the counter attacks. Okay. Um, and, and if we continue, you can see uh, that on, on those goals, 34% of the goals, there was only one pass before the goals, like we talked before. 15%, there were two passes, 3%, th uh, 21%, three passes, 6%, four passes, you know, as, as you can see, and 15% were zero passes. So it was just maybe a rebound and a goal. Um, so those, you can see also some interesting numbers on the passing. Uh, I want to ask Katie. Katie, why do you feel that 34%, And I know I asked that before, but now that you see the why, why is the difference? Why the majority of the goals are only from one pass? Um, I think a, a big part of it is probably is fatigue. I think once you reach the last stages of the competition, um, it becomes a lot harder to to combine, and that also goes with the standard increasing as you get further and further. Um, so as you reach the semifinals, the teams you're playing against are better, so it's harder to play four or five passes. Um, But yeah, I think the main reason is probably at this stage it's it's fatigue and the option to play quicker is is probably more effective. Uh, thank you, Coach Ivan and, and Anna. How do you, and how do you think you can increase, you know, being a game that is so small, the field, and how can you increase the number of counterattacks? Maybe how can you because I think it could be a very good chance to score. You steal the ball and you go quickly and counterattack. I think this is a If teams increase this, it can increase the their number of goals. How can you uh, you feel that you can increase this? Uh, we increase this moment uh, in trainings. So we um, uh, focused on the possession of the ball and uh, another team, another part of our team in this moment thinking about the counter attack. And I told to my players every time, when you defend, you think about the attack. When you attack, you think about the defense because beach soccer is a very very energetic very action uh, sport so you think about uh, the situation the another situation in this moment uh, so in our trainings uh, we try to do the counter attacks after uh, after the possession of another part of our team thank you 
Now the next uh, slide talks about uh, the set play goals. As you, as you can see, the majority of the set play goals, they came from 40% of them were for free kicks, okay? 33% uh, were in throw-ins, which is a very high number. 20% uh, in kickoff, 6% in penalty, and 3% in corner kicks, okay? Um, do you, so I, uh, I want to ask uh, Paula, what is your opinion about this? And as a coach, you know, with the set plays, what is your opinion about this, uh, these numbers? And you as a coach, what do you think you can do better and in training to, to take advantage of these percentages? Tú como entrenadora, ¿qué opinas de los, de los porcentajes? Como entrenadora, ¿crees que entonces tienes que trabajar más tiros libres, más los laterales? Y para, eh, mirando los números, tomar ventaja de esta estadística. Bueno, yo creo que en fútbol playa cualquier tiro libre, sea falta o penalti, es una ocasión clara de gol. Y por supuesto que las jugadoras todas tienen que estar preparadas para para poder eh, efectuar y, y que sea un golpeo preciso y bueno, así que sí, yo creo que, que es una, una acción muy importante a entrenar y tener en cuenta. Gracias. She feels that, that, that in beach soccer, being a small field and with the free kicks, you have to train them a lot because it's, it's almost a goal. Free kick, free kick, free kick and a PK is, is almost, it's a very dangerous play, so you have to train that a lot. Eh, Carol, ¿qué opinas tú sobre lo, la, las laterales? Que 33% de los goles de, de jugadas paradas fueron en laterales. Eh, ¿Cuál es tu opinión de este, de este número? ¿Qué piensas? A ver, about yo it? creo que... Ah, vale, perdón. Sorry, vale. ¿Qué piensas about que el 33% de los goles fueron from throwings and kickings? ¿Qué es tu opinión sobre esto? Yo creo que cada jugada que es tanto falta, saque de banda, etcétera, pues son jugadas de peligro porque juegas con una ventaja a la hora de, de disfrutar el balón porque tienes dos futbolistas igual contra una que te sale. Y creo que son jugadas manifiestas de gol porque en cuanto haces el saque pues puedes hacer un tiro y eso es una ventaja. Ok, eh, gracias. Uh, she feels that those plays you have to work and, and train because they're very dangerous in this sport and it can make a difference in the game and it can give you an advantage. Okay, so we'll continue. And guys, the people that are watching us all over the world, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, please type them in and we'll answer at the end of the, of the presentation. And now we're going to talk a little bit about marking. Vamos a... One second, sorry. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the marking, you know, person to person marking or zone marking. Okay, so what do you prefer as a player, as a coach? Okay, and we're going to show a little video. First, we have uh, this is from the final Madrid against Playa San Javier. Here is an example of men, uh, men to men marking. And here's an example of zone marking, also from the final. As you can see, the player from San Javier makes the run and then the, whoever's in that zone picks up the mark and the player up front stays with the, with the ball. So I wanna um, I wanna ask uh, I wanna ask Paula, which one uh, do you think is more efficient, the man to man or the zone marking? Paula, ¿cuál crees tú que es más eficaz, la marca persona o la marca hombre persona persona? 
Eh, yo creo que depende de, del equipo que tengas y del rival al que te enfrentes. Nosotras, por ejemplo, en la final eh, creímos que, que contra San Javier, que es el mejor equipo que, que hay, pues la, el mejor marcaje iba a ser zonal porque son jugadoras individualmente muy, muy buenas. Pero sí que, por ejemplo, en semifinales contra Locrians hicimos un marcaje mixto, es decir... Eh, había jugadoras eh, marcaje, con marcaje individual y, y jugadoras con marcaje en zona. Ok, gracias. She feels that depending on the team that you're playing, you have to adopt your tactic. For example, she says in the final, she played against Playa San Javier and they had very good individual players. So she, just, she opted for a zone marking. In the, semi, in the semifinals against Locrian, she mixed the marking zone and, men, and person to person. And so she thinks you got to adapt it depending on who are you playing. Uh, what, do you, what are your, your thoughts, eh, Carol? Di, háblame tú un poquito sobre esta final, que como ahí vimos ustedes marcaron más individual. Eh, ¿Cuál es tu opinión sobre los dos tipos de marca y cuál crees tú que, que es más eficaz? A ver, en mi opinión, eh, nosotras en el equipo, en el ASP de San Javier, pues no tenemos un marcaje específico. O sea, lo importante es comunicarse y saber interpretar bien el juego cuando tienes que marcar individual y cuando, cuando tienes que marcar en zona. A mí, sinceramente, pues no me gusta ninguno en específico porque yo prefiero que mi compañera que está detrás mía me vaya diciendo lo que lo que está sucediendo, o deja, o sigue, o, o quietas. Entonces, eso yo creo que es comunicación de cada equipo y en cada momento del juego. O sea, si tú vas ganando de, de dos, o, o de uno arriba, o de tres, no te interesa marcar persona, o sea, no te interesa marcar individualmente. Si vas perdiendo, pues para remontar el partido igual sí. Pero ya te digo, en nuestro caso en el equipo... Nos comunicamos bastante bien y, y leemos eso muy bien. Entonces, yo creo que es la base fundamental a la hora de, de hacer una buena defensa. Gracias. So, I asked her which one was the, the preferred marking in her team, in her opinion. And she just, she says that the key is to have very good communication. Communication between all the players, especially the players in the back, and to be able to adapt and to play. Maybe if you're winning, you play a zone. If you're losing, you play man. And depending on the situation of the game, she, that's what she feels is the key to communicate so you can adjust. Uh, what is your opinion on this, uh, Barbara? Qual é a tua opinião sobre a marcação? Você que joga atrás, é, me diz um pouquinho. Eu concordo que com ela, o que elas falaram. Realmente acho que não tem um certo ou errado é adaptar a característica do seu time ao adversário, o período também, né, quanto que está o placar, e essa comunicação que a, que a Carol citou, acho muito importante, principalmente talvez a gente que joga atrás, de comunicar, sentir o, o, o que vai ser melhor para aquela decisão do momento, e eu acho que o conjunto dos dois, da zona, com essa comunicação para mudar a jogadora, para marcação jogador-jogador, Eu acho que é perfeito pela comunicação. Obrigado. She feels that she agrees with Carol that it has to be a lot of communication. She's a defender and she is you have to communicate and let your players know. So you can start on a, on a person to person and then communicate and maybe switch the player and go to a zone. So it's the key is the communication. And what what do you feel about this, uh, Katie? Yeah, I agree with everything everyone said, um, but I think the other two things I would say is is probably squad size. Um, I know San Javier had a couple more players than what Madrid did, so in terms of fatigue, um, zone marking is probably a more efficient way to to mark. And like I said, the stage of the competition, your your day seven of a tournament, um, energy levels are low. So if you've got the squad size to go and press and and man-to-man -man mark, then that's that's the best option. But if if you don't have the squad size or the energy levels, then it's very difficult to, to maintain that for three periods at that stage of a competition. Thank you. Uh, what do you guys feel, Anna and Ivan, about this topic? What is your opinion? Uh, I, I think that uh, if the team want to play to, in modern beach soccer, uh, they try to mix 
uh, in some situation, the man-to-man -man, person person marking or zone marking. And I think it uh, it's a very important feature that uh, if you uh, work with your team for a long time and you feel your players, feel your defenders, so you can choose, uh, depend on situation, depend on opponent. But if you not uh, know your players, uh, maybe you can try to to do some very very simple uh, simple marking. And for me, it's a simple more simple to mark as man to man because it's more simple to explain to players. You see your opponent and come to opponent. But uh, for in the long distance for a long period, uh, the team can make to choose. Is uh, this this uh, defending defense? Uh, for me, person to person or zone marking, it's not important. Uh, just I want uh, not a lot of dangerous situation near my goal, and uh, I don't want to miss goals. It's all <laughs> simple. <laughs> very, very simple. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and now since we're talking about the the marking. Also interesting, you know, uh, to get your opinion, since you guys are the top coaches and top players in the game and the competition, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important, you know, let's talk a little bit about high pressure and low pressure marking. Okay, so here are some examples. And then I want to get your opinion, guys, on this. So here, here you can see, again, San Javier in the final pressing high, as soon as they get the ball, they're pressing. And they win the ball. So that's a high press. And now, uh, San Javier has the ball. Madrid is marking. And as you can see, they're waiting for them in the midfield line. So that's the low press marking, giving that outside shot. Okay, so I want to ask uh, Paula, uh, you know, since you guys, like you just said in this final, you, you were playing a, a zone and you were low pressing as we can see at least in this part of, at the beginning of the game a, tell us a little bit a, why you did this and also is there something that if you could have done differently you would have done a, cuéntanos un poquito hablando de alta presión baja presión aquí vemos que ustedes están haciendo baja presión y jugando por zona cuéntame un poquito a, sobre cuál fue el motivo de esto Y si pudieras haber hecho algo diferente en esta final si lo hubieras hecho. Eh, bueno, yo creo que conforme fue la final y conforme terminó, pues eh, no cambiaría nada, ¿no? Eh, lo que sí, pues nosotras vimos que, que San Javier, como te he dicho, es un equipo bueno. Al final la mayoría de las jugadoras de la selección española están ahí. Y son jugadoras que llevan mucho tiempo jugando a fútbol playa y, y golpean muy, muy bien. Además, eh, un golpeo raso que, que buscan que el balón eh, golpee en la arena y, y la portera prácticamente no tenga tiempo de reaccionar y, y pueda ser gol. Entonces, nuestro planteamiento fue, fue así, también porque creo que individualmente, como he dicho antes, son jugadoras muy buenas y, y muy difíciles de, de seguir. Ok. Uh, she says that her, the, the reason why they played on a zone and low pressure against San Javier was because the quality of the players, that they were very dangerous. So she was giving that outside shot, but not allowing them to play with the ball in their half because of the, the players, they were so dangerous. Uh, I, and I want to ask uh, you, Carol, you know, you as being a, you know, one of the top players in the world, you know, the, you were the last Qatar, you were the best player. This tournament, you were considered the best player. Uh, and as, as we can see in the video, you play with very high intensity. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, a, as a player 
and, and why and where did you learn how to play with such high intensity? Tú como jugador siendo una de las mayores jugadoras del mundo, fuiste nombrada en Qatar en este torneo también y siempre juegas ustedes jugando en presión alta y juegas siempre con intensidad como jugadora, siempre que estás en la cancha. Cuéntame un poquito eh, y qué le puedes decir a las jugadoras que quieren llegar a donde tú estás un día, dónde aprendiste a jugar así y el motivo por el que juegas así. A ver, yo me considero una futbolista muy cabezota y eso es lo que, lo que me caracteriza en todos los ámbitos. Eh, soy muy rápida, eh, me gusta mucho trabajar en la sombra, entrenar, como dije antes, todos los días que tengo un reto libre y eso pues me hace ser quien soy. soy una me considero una persona normal, súper humilde y, y los premios que, que llegan es por, por mi trabajo, por mi esfuerzo y, y por la dedicación que, que le hago a este deporte. Entonces, yo a todas las niñas que, que quieren llegar a donde estoy yo, les digo que, que luchen por sus sueños, que, que los sueños se cumplen y que, que trabajen y que no dejen de trabajar nunca. Que eso es la base de todo éxito. Okay. Gracias. Well, she says that everything for her has come with a lot of hard work. That every time that she has free time, she's training, working extra hard to improve in her craft. So that's the advice you will give all the young women players they want to, you know, one day be at the top of the beach soccer world is work hard, train, put in the work. There's no, there's no secret. That's, that's her secret. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, now I want to ask you, Anna, uh, you, as a, you as a goalkeeper, how do you feel? Do you feel confident if your team was, were to play low pressure and allow the other teams to shoot from that zone, zone three. Tell me. Um, I can say about uh, opponents. Uh, uh, the goalkeeper uh, doesn't like high pressure very much. Uh, you start uh, to get nervous, make mistakes. You don't have much time to make a decision. But uh, in general, high or low pressure, it uh, all depends on the opponent's game, the physical condition of the team and uh, the score on the table. Mm, I can add, Anna, uh, in our trainings, uh, we can mix uh, high and low pressure. So one part of our team high, will play with high pressure, another part go to uh, the goal, go to low pressure. And uh, when we mix, uh, we have some situation in the game when we can choose some of these uh, variants. Okay, thank you very much. What is your opinion, uh, Katie, about high and low pressure? What do you prefer as a, as a, as a defender? Um, I don't mind either, really. I think as a back player, I think for me, it doesn't make too much difference because I can I can see the whole field. But I think it depends largely on the opponents. And I think Madrid played it very well with their low press because they knew that San Javier liked to play across the back and, and they tried to draw you out. And the same for San Javier. I think they played it well with the high press because number 10 for Madrid had a very good tournament. And I think making sure that they were pressing high and touch tight all the time limited her opportunities to score goals. Um, so I think both both were effective, which you can see because the game ended three all. So yeah, I think it just depends on the opponent, the opponents, and who you're up against. Thank you. Um, so now we now that we talked a little bit about the tournament and, and got into depth and analyzed the different statistics. Uh, I want to get, you know, your thoughts. Now I want to talk a little bit about the future of the women's beach soccer game, which I think is bright. I'm excited. I know the players here in the U.S. are excited, our, our national team players, our players in general. Um, and I know all players around the world. We can't wait to get back to play in a tournament. I want to see you guys play, see you guys coach. Uh, so a little bit about the future. And, and talking about the future, you know, in, in this tournament, we didn't see a lot of teams you playing with the goalkeeper's feet, okay? Uh, we only had two teams out of the 20 and one team in the quarters. So one of the teams that 
that play with the goalkeeper was, it was Anna uh, Zvezda. You guys always tried to build with the goalkeeper. And, and the other team was Locranes Lo from uh, Italy. Now, and as, as we can see here, I want to show uh, this goal. So, oops. There we go. Here the goalkeeper Lopez from Locranes gets the ball. And as you can see, it's against Madrid. Again to the goalkeeper. Okay, so I want to ask you, Anna, being a goalkeeper that uses feet, why do you think only two teams out of the 20 were playing major, you know, using the keeper as an offensive tool with the feet? I know a lot of the teams use the goalies to throw the ball, but uh, with the feet. Why do you think this is happening? I can say in the future, every team will have a goalkeeper who plays with feet. Uh, this is a future trend uh, because uh, the team has uh, a lot of options for developing the attack uh, if it plays with goalkeeper. And uh, in training, you should pay a lot of attention to this element. Uh, for example, in my team, 30% uh, of the training process is uh, improving the technique uh, of uh, playing with the goalkeeper. And uh, you can see results in our games. <clears throat> and I can add, Anna, uh, why only the two teams? I think that now only two teams, but in the future we have more teams. Uh, I think that Russia and uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil pay a lot of attention to the goalkeepers to play by defeat, to this component of the game. And uh, maybe players, all of the players include goalkeepers in Russia, Brazil and uh, also Switzerland, uh, specialize uh, more in beach soccer than in another kind of football. So I think maybe, maybe we see uh, the uh, goalkeeper playing by the feet, but in the future, yeah. we think that it's a it's a trend. It's a trend. We'll of more teams. We'll see more teams in the future. Yeah, of course. Okay, uh, Barbara, o que você acha sobre uh, nesse torneio só teve dois times que usavam o goleiro para jogar com o pé? Você acha que o futuro do beat soccer feminino vai ter mais times que jogam com o goleiro com o pé? Com certeza, eu acho que é o futuro. Já é uma realidade, né? É, nessa competição apenas duas equipes, né? na verdade duas equipes mais três goleiras, porque no time do Ivan as duas goleiras jogam perfeitamente com o pé, aqui a gente viu o Lele, Lele Lopes, então eu acho que assim abre um leque de possibilidades, eu acho que é mais do que um, um diferencial, é uma arma para ser usada assim quando necessário, por que não? para abrir espaço, para um chute que seja, então eu acho que cada vez mais as, eu vejo as goleiras evoluindo nesse quesito e eu acredito que cada ano terão terão mais goleiras. Obrigado. She feels that, uh, that yeah, this will be the future, they will have more goalies playing with their feet. She says that uh, we actually had three goalies, or it was two teams, but she said that the Svezda team, actually both of their goalies used their feet. So she sees that Helping the game. Eh, why, why? Quiero preguntarte a ti, Carol. ¿Qué opinas tú sobre este tema de las porteras usando el pie? What do you think, Car Carol, uh, about the future and the keepers using more their feet to build the place? A ver, yo creo que es una parte fundamental que las porteras jueguen con los pies. Se ve en el equipo de la Suecia y la selección rusa que son superiores porque saben manejar cuatro jugadores de campo más, más la portera, que son cinco. Entonces eso crea superioridades que a veces nos cuesta leer. Pero yo creo que trabajando más tiempo y no individualmente, sino pudiendo juntarnos más veces al año, pues yo creo que esto se podría entrenar y, 
y que sería mejor y que mejoría, mejoraríamos un montón en el juego y, y individualmente también. Gracias. She feels that um, that by the teams adding more and more the keeper with their feet into the play, it makes it difficult. She says, for example, when she plays against Russia, it's very difficult because you don't know. Now you have five against four. You have the keeper using her feet, so it's, it's more difficult to mark and to make a decision what to do if I go, if I stay. So she thinks that with more women's competitions and with the increase of the women's game, uh, this will improve as well. So with more games, more competition, teams will have more opportunities to train and to improve this. Uh, I want to get, get your opinion, Paula, about this. ¿Cuál es tu opinión, Paula, sobre el futuro y el, las mujeres jugando con el pie, las porteras usando el pie? Yo creo, como dije, que para mí es la, la posición más importante en, en este deporte. No solo tiene la responsabilidad de parar, que ya es eh, bastante, sino que también tienen que estar muy activas y muy participativas en el juego, ¿no? Eh, sería importante entrenar mucho más en equipo, poder que las, que las chicas puedan hacerlo para desarrollarlo más, pero sí, ahora, por ejemplo, Ana es una portera eh, que se atreve, que, que sale, que juega con el pie sin problema y equipos como Locrias, como estamos viendo, tiene también grandes porteras que, que se atreven y, y lo hacen y es de admirar. Ok, gracias. Eh, she also feels that, that it's, it's very important to have keepers that use their feet because they it will change the, the game and it gives the team an advantage, okay? And I want to get your opinion, Katie, about this topic. Uh, and also, if you think that as we have more women's competition, maybe in the future, Women's World Cup, uh, will this be something that you see that more teams will be trending to play with, uh, you know, will be trending to play with the feet? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely an element of the game that's going to progress. Um, but I would I would say as as a back player, I think there's an importance to establish a good relationship with your goalkeeper. Um, so I know working with with Hannah at the back, um, I have to concentrate a lot on our relationship and trusting each other. So I think that's a big part of it. And also, I'd say for for improvement for the goalkeepers going forward using their feet um, as they've technically got better. Um, I think this is something that Anna herself does very well is is her decision making under pressure. Um, and I think that's that's the next stage of the goalkeepers using their feet because the more and more they use their feet, um, the percentage of decision making needs to needs to improve and the decisions need to be better. Thank you, Katie. Okay, so um, now I want to thank you know I want to thank everybody for their watch that has been watching. I want to thank the participants for sharing your experience. You know, it was amazing. I learned a lot today. Um, and to finish this, you know, this beach soccer talk, and, you know, we're excited about, again, seeing you guys back on the field. I want to get your final thoughts and, you know, your opinion where the game is heading, where, is, where it came, and the future of the women's beach soccer, and especially this tournament, the Aero winner, Women's Aero Winners Cup. Hey, I want to start with Anna and Ivan. Your final thoughts, please. Yes, um, I will not talk about uh, past tournaments. Uh, you have seen all the statistics and uh, we have talked about everything. But uh, I want to say that uh, no one has managed uh, to win the cup twice in four years. And uh, I think it will happen at the next Euro Winners Cup. It will be Zvezda or not, uh, I will not say. But uh, goalkeeper is 50% uh, of the team and uh, I will do everything possible and uh, impossible to help uh, the team take the cup uh, for the second time. I finished. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bravo. Bravo, Emma. Very good, very like, good. To every, promise. everybody, yes, from Russia with love to everybody. Thank you, Ivan. That's very interesting what she said, that no team has won back-to-back -back this tournament. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting stat. Um, I want to get uh, Barbara, to your conclusion, your opinion final, about the beach soccer feminino, the tournament of the women's Aero winners, 
em geral, o futuro? Então, é agradeço né, essa conversa que eu acho que é muito interessante para todos nós ver essas análises. É, vejo uma evolução muito visível mesmo é, nesses quatro anos e eu acho que o, o futuro, é, a gente só pode esperar coisas boas. Eu acho assim, está todo mundo ansioso né, para para retornar às areias e a Eurowings realmente é uma é uma competição especial. Te dizer que se perguntar para a maioria das atletas, elas vão falar quero jogar a Euro e estão ansiosas por esse momento. E obrigada. Obrigada a você. She says that, uh, the, that the players can't wait to get back on the sand and play other tournaments. They're excited and she 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 thinks that this is a, the Euro, the women's Euro winner is a magical tournament. And then if you ask the majority of the players, they can't wait to play the next edition of it because it has like a magical feeling to it. So thank you, Barbara. And next, I want to finish up, Katie. I want to um, get your final thoughts. And also, I want I want to get, after we talked about the Euro winners, and if you can also share and compare the, comp the club competition in Europe with the club's competition in the United States, since you have been... You know, I've, I had the honor of watching you play here a couple of times in the U.S. Yeah. So maybe you can compare and, and how do you see the future in both in Europe and in, in, the, in this continent, the U.S. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, first of all, I think there needs to be an importance to kind of uh, establish these type of competitions in, in different continents. So, for example, now the USA are creating more and more tournaments and, and growing their own talent. And I think there needs to be um, a lot more of this and I think that's why Spain this year have been so dominant is because they've they've grown their own talent and they've got an established league so I think that's really important going forward um, and in terms of of the difference between USA and Europe I think going to the USA I, I know I'm, I'm in for a physical game and it's in American DNA to kind of graft and work hard and and the Americans definitely bring that side of the game um, and I think in Europe perhaps is is maybe not as physical at times, but tactically and technically, um, it's it's a lot more demanding. So, for example, when we play play Zvezda, you spend a lot of a lot of the game without the ball. So it's not it's not about uh, how how long you can run or how physical you are. It's it's more mental and tactical and and having to use your opportunities and create what you can when you can. So I think that's the two differences. But um, from playing in both, I would say. Europeans should go over to the USA, play, play and experience that, and the USA girls and should come over to Europe and play in the European League. So I think we can both learn off each other. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, Paula, tu hablanos un poquito de lo que ves el futuro del beach soccer y una conclusión y en España, en Europa y en el mundo. Yo creo que, que estamos en un buen camino, pero que, que hay que desarrollar más, más torneos eh, de forma internacional y de forma nacional cada país y sobre todo darle más apoyo y reconocimiento a, a las chicas, que, que ellas al final en, se dejan la, la piel casi por poder ir y jugar y les encanta este deporte y yo creo que, que se merecen todo, todo lo bueno que, que les pueda llegar. Y sobre todo vamos a intentar prestar más atención a, a las niñas pequeñas y a intentar inculcarles este deporte lo, lo antes posible, que al final el, el futuro va a depender de ellas. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Suerte con el Madrid. Eh, well, I asked her about the future and what she thinks. She says that it's very important to develop the sport. We have to develop uh, more tournaments. Uh, she thinks that we have to also, very important to recognize the players because the players, the girls that are playing the sport, they love beach soccer. So we need to recognize them in her opinion. Um, and also she feels that we also need to worry about the little ones, the little girls, the young girls, 10, 11, 12, and, and start to develop them and to teach them the game of beach soccer as well. Um, now I wanna ask, to, uh, the same question to Carol. Carol, quería tu, 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 que finalizaras, que nos dieras tu perspectiva del futuro del beach soccer 
tú como estás ahora en la cima del deporte, como jugadora, como a nivel de club y de selección, has ganado en 2019 todo lo que se puede ganar, ¿qué ves tú en el futuro y cuál es tu perspectiva? You there are, you're in the top of the sport right now in the women's game, you're champ individually and collectively, in the club level and the national team, you've won everything this past year, so tell us a little bit. A ver, yo creo lo mismo que, que dijeron ellos, que esto está creciendo a pasos bastante agigantados, pero que tenemos que ser conscientes que, que no va a llegar a ser nuestro trabajo, al menos por el momento. Entonces, cuantos más campeonatos se puedan hacer, pues mejor. Y nada, pues como dices tú, ahora mismo pues estoy ahí arriba, pero, pero eso no dura siempre. Hay que seguir trabajando día a día, que, que nadie te va a regalar nada. Para toda esa gente que, que nos está viendo, sea de equipo, sea de, de donde sea, que yo espero que, que los equipos vengan reforzados, porque eso a, a las deportistas como yo pues, pues nos hace ser más exigentes y, y trabajar más. Porque no sabes cómo vas a llegar a enfrentarte a cualquier equipo y si todos llegamos a un nivel óptimo, pues es mejor porque esto, esto crece. Muchas gracias, Carol. Suerte con la selección y con tu club. Eh, well, she she says that um, that the sport, the women's beach soccer, is growing a lot, uh, but she just hopes that we have more competitions, more tournaments, more leagues, so she can make this. You know, right now is is a part time job for her. She wishes she can make this her her full time job because she loves the sport. Um, she knows that right now she's in the top of the sport. But as just like the, she got there, somebody else can come and take it away from her and her teams. So she wants to challenge the other teams, the other clubs, the other national teams to train hard. So give to give her a challenge because that's what is the sport. You know, you want people to prepare for the next competition so she can get a challenge and that will make, at the end of the day, everybody grow. All the teams will grow with this. So that's what she hopes and She hopes to see everybody. So I want to thank you guys, everybody, for your feedback, your opinion. If you're watching, uh, you know, we love this game. We love beach soccer. We love women's beach soccer. And we hope that together we can help it grow and, and, and get bigger every day. Okay? Keep training hard and see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you for everything. Bye. Ciao.